Our guest says research indicates that close to 8% of workers smoke cannabis when they're not on the job. And of course, that off-duty behavior could open up gray areas when it comes to employer responsibilities when recreational cannabis officially becomes legal October 17th. We're joined by Bill Howitt. He's chief researcher for workforce productivity at Morneau Chappelle. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's a big, I mean, a big chunk of the population smokes cannabis. Yes. Uh, some might say, well, off duty, uh, how does that any business of the employer how, how should employers think about this? Well, I think it's important, actually, people fall in different categories, of course, mm -hmm. right? So some people are using it daily. So approximately about 7.7% .7 of the population use cannabis daily prior to going to work. About what 9 point... Oh, no. What, yeah. You're saying 8% of the population yeah. get stoned before they go to work? Well, I don't know if they're getting stoned. That's the other thing that's challenging about this, is that's where this is whole conversation why it's going to be interesting, because uh -huh. it's around impairment. You see, it depends on how much they're smoking. It depends on what type of use they are. Mm -hmm. It depends on how the frequency. So, for example, if someone smokes a joint, and let's say it's 10%, okay? Potency. Potency yeah. of tetrahydrocannabal delta-9, which is a psychoactive drug. We need to remember this is a psychoactive drug. Yeah. And it is addictive. So if someone smokes this drug, it can stay in their system up to four hours if they smoke it. So depending on where they're at, so if they get up in the morning at 5 and they have one, their risk of impairment's less. But what we do know is there's daily users, there's people that use it weekly, there's people who use it monthly, there's people who use it casual. But what we need to be aware of on a daily, if, they have, if the population of Canada is about 17 million to 18 million working full-time, part-time. Okay. So that's approximately 1.3 million people that are th considering using marijuana, which is now we call a cannabis, mm -hmm. before they go to work. Before they go to, I hadn't seen, that sounds like a real national problem. Um, wh wh who's done this research? Well, I, I just re actually was doing a presentation yesterday at the Conference Board of Canada, and I was reading a brief from another white paper I was looking at, and I can get you the reference that doesn't sure. come oh, top no, yeah, ahead sure. right now. Yep. But it is, it is, to me, I think what the challenge is, is the same thing as alcohol. I think we have to realize lots of the people with alcohol addiction aren't the people in Skid Row the people coming to work every day as well. It's, yeah, it's fascinating, you know, and I, I think you've noted that this is a unique thing. It's a, it's a drug, it's a dangerous drug in some ways, yes. uh, like alcohol, yeah. but it's now, it's used both medically and now recreationally, yes. legally, so it's a unique situation. Yes, as of October 17th, I hear. Yes, um, now you raise the, the complications here. If somebody's using the drug for fun and they manage to get a medical prescription, mm -hmm. um, they could start coming to work under the influence and they would have a right to do so? No, or how does that no, work? and that's where I think it's, they, the big thing is going to be around fit to duty. Okay. So the big thing is just because, and I think it's really important to simplify and step back for a second, whether they use it recreational or they use it for medical use, they still can't come to work impaired. Okay. So what has to happen is their accommodation, if they have an accommodation to use it, depending on the THC level, depending on when the dosing is allowed, there's a bunch of different variables. The challenge is, in Canada at this point in time, when a person gets an authorization, they could get different dosings from CBD, which is the medical part that does all the wonderful stuff, and then the THC is a psychoactive piece. You combine those two together to create the synergy. But if someone's using it, for example, at low dosing and taking it at the right time, their impairment risk, based on their accommodation between their physician, between the employer, they get comfortable with the accommodation. But if somebody, for example, gets a different strain and they're not paying attention to the strain and gets a higher dosing. See, this is not like a bottle of beer that has 4.9% alcohol. No. There's, there's literally, the, the drug changes by its dosing and its impact. Plus, people react differently. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating area. So you think employers actually should take it on to, to tell their staff some of the basics, to educate their staff? Uh, uh, ab the absolutely. My, my uh, being paying attention to listen to employers, I think employers fall in two buckets. One bucket, I think employers are saying, hey, it's been around. Lots of people are using marijuana or cannabis on a daily basis or recreational. It's in our society. People have been using it for medical use for a while. Mm -hmm. Let's not overthink this. 
there's a substance use policy. We might want to make sure we do, do some changes to making sure we have provisions for cannabis use, accommodations, making sure people know not to use it in the smoke-free zones, create some education around that, update our policy, and make sure we're tight on accommodations. And lawyers are really the experts in helping to do that. All right? But then there's another group that are starting to say, OK, let's elevate this and ask two questions. One, why are people using it for medical use? And the College of Physicians would suggest that it would be a narrow because there's a lack of research to suggest all the use. So they probably have a narrow use. So they'll provide narrow recommendations for a person to use it. So there's a medical use and there's some wise. And over the next 12, 14, 16, 20 months, there'll be all kinds of research. Now we go to the other side. So why do people use it recreational? Well, in Canada, we have a mental health issue. It's a, one of the fastest growing disabilities in our country. If you look at most people's short-term and long-term disability, one of the number one cause is that. Mm -hmm. So it comes down with the recreational use. Is my concern is with, that some people are using it for self-medication. They might be using it ways to cope and compensate. Mm -hmm. And we, we already have an epidemic, in my mind, growing with mental health. And so I don't want to be an alarmist, but I think it's really good for us as employers to spend time educating people on why they do it, mm -hmm. making sure we don't assume they understand fit for duty, making sure they understand the difference when you smoke it, it stays in your system this long. If you digest it, it stays in your system this long. For example, same dosing, smoke it, could be four hours. It might stay in your body in your, for longer, yeah. but your impairment risk to be able to, where you're at risk is up to four hours. But people are overconfident, so they sometimes think of two hours. Digest it, it could be up to 24, 25 hours. It's a different drug. We have to understand it's more complex, and I think we need to educate employees and managers on how to actually have conversations on this, because there's going to be a big learning curve coming. It's a fascinating area. We'll have to have you back because yeah. um, we'd like to, obviously Canada's had a very poor uh, um, record on labor productivity over the past few decades. We'd love to get your take. Is there a risk here? But we're out of time. Okay. Thank you very much for Thank joining you so us much. today. Bill Howitt joined us, Chief Research Officer for Workforce Productivity at Morneau Chappelle.